Hi there, I'm Clifford Bates, and welcome to our next session of Reading Montesquieu's Spirit of the Laws. So it's today we're looking at book four, which is within part one of the eight books of part one. So we're at halfway point, right? Right. This is the halfway point of part one, which deals with the introduction of the themes of the quite general question of the laws, uh, the introduction to concept what the, the nature of the, the, the laws Montesquieu argues are in that sense, and the, uh, and the three fundamental types of uh, governments that he talks about. Uh, now he's going to, today's topic book is that the laws of education should be relative to the principles of government. Okay, that's the principle. That the education, the laws of education, the educations of each system is going to be relative to the type of principle of the government of each type of uh, system. So let's go. The laws of education are uh, uh, the first we receive. So therefore he's saying, in other words, things we educate about, education, which our, our education of our child, are uh, things, this is the first, uh, these are the, the laws regarding the, the principles here are the first we see. And these, uh, uh, and as these prepare us to be citizens, each particular family should be governed according to the plan of the great family that includes them all. So therefore, the idea is that the laws shape the family, the laws of the regime, you know, the government type shape the, the way the family operates and that things, and they shape, their, and there should be kind of a, a, a connection between what the, what the regime says or the, or the principles of the government say and what the, uh, uh, you know, how the family is in that sense, in structure. If there is a principle for the, the people uh, taken generally, then the parts which compose it, that is the families, will also, uh, will, uh, will have one also. Therefore, the laws of education will be different in each kind of government. In monarchy, the object will be honor, republics, virtue, and despotism of fear. Again, this is the, the objects of the education of the situations are going to be relative similar to that. So the education will be in republic, or monarchies will be on, the education that will be fostered and developed into how families um, uh, uh, will be honor that within the republic's virtue and that which in despotism's fear. So let's go now to chapter two. He starts out education of monarchies. In monarchies, the principal education is is um, is not in the public institutions where children are instructed. In a way, education begins when one enters the world. The world is the school uh, of what of what is called honor, uh, and the universe master, uh, the universal master, should be uh, uh, everywhere. Uh, should everywhere guide us. So that the world is the, the world of honor, right? Here, one sees and always hears three things: that a certain nobility must put, uh, that a certain nobility must be put in the virtues, a certain frankness in the mores, and a certain politeness in the manners. So, therefore, the, think the three things: right, a, ver, a, 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 a nobility in the virtues, frankness in the mores, the mores, and, uh, and a certain politeness in the manners. Politeness is important here. The virtues we are shown here are always less what one owes each other than what uh, one owes to oneself. So therefore, it's not what we, the virtue here focuses on less what we owe to each other, but what, is, what we owe to oneself. They are not so much what we call, uh, 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 what call us to our fellow citizens as what distinguishes uh, us from them. So therefore, again, this is the point. The virtue here focuses more on the self of the person how it relates to him and deals with him or her, and not so much uh, brings people to others, to one's fellow citizens, but distinguishes from them, right? He says, one uh, uh, judges men's actions here not as good, but as fine, beautiful. Uh, um, not as just, but as great. Not as reasonable, but as extraordinary. So in other words, he's, Again, good is fine, that is just but great, reasonable but extraordinary. As soon as honor can find someone, uh, something noble here, honor becomes either a judge who makes it legitimate or a sophist who justifies it. Uh, it allows uh, gallantry, uh, it allows gallantry when gallantry is united with an idea of, uh, uh, with the idea of an, at uh, an attachment of the, of, uh, of the heart or the idea of conquest. 
it, and uh, this is the true reason Moors are never a, 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 as pure in monarchies as in republican governments. So Moors are more pure in republican governments, they're arguing that Moors are never going to be as pure in monarchies as they are in republican government because of this idea that, 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 that he says here that, that um, gallantry is united with an attachment towards the, or, uh, the heart and heart with con an idea of conquest, right? It allows deceit. When deceit is ad, is added to to the ideas of greatness of spirit or a greatness of business, as in politics, where niceties do not offend it, whose niceties do not offend it, it forbids all. Uh, 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 adulation, adulation, only when adulation is separated from the uh, uh, from the idea of a great fortune and is joined only with the feeling of one's own mean one's own meanness i have said that in monarchies education should bring a certain frankness to the moors however truth is desired uh, moreover truth is desired in speech but is for uh, uh, but is this for the love of truth in other words truth should be desired in not at all it is desired because man accustomed to speaking the truth appears to be daring and free indeed such a man seems independent only on things and not on uh, the ways uh, uh, and not on the ways others receive them. So again, this is tied. It's not that you know being frank and being things concerned with um, uh, a love of the truth, but rather the, the perception of the person doing it not being dependent, being free, or being uh, being daring and free, as he says. This is why commending this kind of frankness here, one scorns that of the people, which has for its only aims truth and simplicity. So the truth here is not, it's, it's again, the truth here is to be daring, perceived as daring and free, not, it's not for truth its own sake and not for simplicity. Finally, education of monarchies requires certain politeness of manners. Men born to live together are also born to please each other. And he who does not observe the proprieties offends all those whom he lives, um, whom he lives, and discredits himself so much that he becomes unable to do anything good. But politeness does not uh, does not accustom uh, sorry, but politeness does not customarily have its origins in such a pure source. It arises from the desire to distinguish oneself. We are polite from arrogance. We flatter ourselves that. Our, ma our manners prove that we are not common, and we have uh, we have lived uh, we have not lived with the sort of people who had been neglected uh, through uh, uh, the ages. The uh, sort of people who have been neglected. There's politeness again shows our superiority. There's a kind of arrogance, condescension, in politeness, in this sense. And, uh, uh, politeness is done for the showing that I'm better than you. Okay, in monarchies, politeness is uh, n naturalized at court. Are ex uh, one ex excessively great man makes all others small. Hence, the regard owed to everyone else and uh, and the politeness that flatters as much as those who are polite, uh, 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 much as those who are polite, as those who are uh, 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 whom they are polite. As uh, okay, as much as those who are polite, as those to whom they are polite. Because that politeness makes it understood that one belongs to the court, or that one, that one is worthy of belonging to us. In other words, the politeness shows that you're worthy to belong, be a member of it. The courtly air consists in putting away one's own greatness for a borrowed greatness. This greatness is more flattering to the courtier than his own. It gives him a certain haughty modesty that spreads far, but whose arrogance diminishes imper uh, imperceptibly in proportion to its uh, to its distance from the uh, the source of that greatness in other words in other words the court courtier's greatness is the person he's a courtier to that this is borrowed and it diminishes as far he, he, the, his greatness was borrowed and that's it. it's not his greatness but is that of the court that of the, who he is a courtier and as he Separates from who his greatness from that emit that greatness that he's borrowing diminishes, right? Uh, uh, um, um, 
at, at court, one finds a, a, a delicacy of taste in all things, which comes from continual use of the excesses of great fortune, from the variety and especially the weariness of pleasures, from the multiplicity, even the confusion of fancies, which, when they are pleasing, are always accepted. Education bears on all these things to make what is called the honet home. Um, oh, that's what he says. Um, this, uh, in the 17th century, the honet became referred to the gentlemen of courtly manners who were not necessarily noble by birth. So therefore, these men, these people, their, their status is not because they're gentlemen, but they're because of who they are in that sense, right? Who has all the qualities and all the virtues required of this government. Honor, meddling in everything, enters into all the modes of thought and all uh, 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 the feelings, ways of feelings, and, and even directs the principle. This eccentric honor shapes the virtues into what it wants and as it wants on its own. It puts rules on everything prescribed to us according to its fancy. It extends or limits our duties whether their source be religion, politics, or morality. So therefore, honor was going to affect all things, including that it's going to reflect uh, uh, and, and redefine um, the, 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 the limits and duties that religion, politics, and morality even impose upon us, right? There is nothing in monarchy that laws, religion, or honor prescribe so much as obedience to the will of the prince. But this honor dictates, uh, but this honor dictates to us that the prince should never prescribe the actions that dishonor us because it would make us incapable of serving him. Quilliam refused to assassinate the Duke of Guise, but he promised to Henry III that he would engage the Duke in, bat the Duke in battle. After St. Bartholomew's Day, when Charles IX had sent orders to all the governors to have the Huguenots massacred, the Viscount of Ort, Ort, who was in command of Bayon, wrote to the king, Sire, I have found among the inhabitants and the warriors only good citizens, brave soldiers, and not one executioner. Thus uh, they and I beg, together beg your majesty to use our arms and our lives for things that can be done. This great and generous cur courage regarded a cowardly action as something as an impossible thing. For the nobility, honor prescribes nothing more than serving the prince in war. Indeed, this is the preeminent profession because it risks and stresses even misfortune led, uh, 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 and even misfortune leads to greatness. But honor wants uh, to be the arbiter in opposing this law. And if honor has been, has been offended, it permits or requires one to withdraw to one's home. If one wants to be able, um, if it wants one to be, uh, it wants one to be able indifferently to aspire to post or to refuse them. It regards this liberty as the greatest, uh, as as greater than fortune itself. Right? So this idea that honor says us is if you know, we can accept it or just reject it. Honor then has its supreme rules and education. And education is obliged to conform to them. The principal rules are that when we are in uh, sorry, the principal rules are that we are indeed allowed to give importance to our fortune, but that we are sovereignly forbidden to give uh, 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 any uh, uh, to uh, to give any to our life. So, in other words, the principles we are give importance to our fortune, but to our life, our life itself it, it, it requires us. In other words, mere survival, if it, you know. Now, we shouldn't really worry, concerned about our life. We should be concerned about greatness and doing great deeds and servicing, servicing our king, our prince. Uh, so that's the first principle, right? The second is that when we have been placed in a rank, we should do or suffer nothing that might show that we consider ourselves inferior to that rank itself. So in other words, we should do or suffer that show that we are inferior to that rank. So we're given a position of rank, <clears throat> We should always behave in that rank. We should always do things acceptable to that rank. And third is that what honor forbids is more rigorously forbidden, rigorously forbidden, when the laws do not agree in prescribing it. In other words, in other words uh, 
And what honor requires is more strongly required when the laws do not require it. That is, in other words, the, the laws don't say you shouldn't do this. The, law, the, the, the laws itself don't say are not going to punish you for doing this or not doing it. But honor will. Okay, and therefore you're commanded by honor to do it. That's the importance of honor in a monarchy. Now he's going to go to uh, the, sec the third chapter, which is on education and despotic regimes. Just as education in monarchy works only to elevate the heart, education in despotic states only seek to bring it down. So if, if the monarchy elevates the heart, uh, 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 education in despotic is to rip the heart out, right? Their education must bring about civil, uh, uh, servility. Um, uh, it, it will be a good, even for the commander, to have such an education, since no one is a tyrant there without at the same time being a slave. Since no one is a tyrant there without also being a slave. So even the ruler, even as, as, as a, extreme obedience assumes ignorance in the one who obeys. It assumes ignorance even in the one who commands. He does not have a, a, a... okay. We had an interruption. Um, extreme obedience assumes ignorance, and even who one's obeys, it assumes ignorance even in the one who commands. He does not have to deliberate, uh, to doubt, or to reason. He has only to want. So that's the nature of the despotic states: is want. He doesn't think is what is want. It's obedience in that sense to what one wants. In despotic states, each household is a separate empire. Therefore, education, which comes mainly from living with each other, is quite limited there. It is reduced to putting fear into the heart and, teach, and in teaching the spirit a few simple, uh, a very simple, a, a, sorry, teaching the spirit a few very simple religious principles. Knowledge will be dangerous, rivalry will be deadly, and as for the virtues, Aristotle cannot believe uh, there are any proper to slaves. This would limit education in this government. Therefore, education is, well, it's interesting that education is kind of the virtue. Therefore, this idea of education is, is tied with the concept of teaching you cabinet skills and virtue. Um, and therefore, you, since slaves don't have virtue in this sense, uh, uh, and whatever skill they will have a very technical skill, um, uh, therefore, the education is going to be very limited here, right? Therefore, education is in a way null there. One must take everything away in order to give something and begin by making a bad subject, begin by making a bad subject in order to make a good slave. Well, why would education be intent upon forming a good citizen to take part in a public uh, uh, unhappiness? <laughs> if he loved the state, he would be tempted to relax the springs of the government. If he failed, he would be ruined. If he succeeded, he would risk, he would run the risk of ruining himself, the prince, and the empire. Now, chapter four is the, uh, he talks about the difference in effect of the education among the ancients and among ourselves. The most ancient peoples lived in governments uh, that had virtue for their principle. And when that virtue was in full force, things were done in those governments that we no longer see and that astonish our small souls. In other words, there's something interesting. The ancients are big giants and we are small creatures, right? And their, gov their governments were kind of full of virtue and our, we kept there and were amazed, right? Uh, their education had another advantage over ours. It was never contradicted. Okay, so that's interesting. In other words, uh, in the last years of his life, Epidamus said, heard and saw and did the same things as at that time, when he was first instructed, there was the, the, this, uh, this consistency. There was a consistency in that set. What he, he lived, he, what he said, he saw, uh, heard, and saw, and did the same things as the times he was first instructed. Right? Today, we receive, we receive three different or opposing educations: that of our fathers, that of our schoolmasters, and that of the world. So, therefore, there's an argument here that he's saying the ancient world there is there was a unitariness of uh, of that the world was everything um, everything was sm maybe smaller and more compact, but now our world is we have three educations, a different or opposing educations, that of our father is that of our schoolmaster and that world. We are told by the last we are we uh, uh, that we are to uh, uh, told 
by the last upsets all the ideas of the first two. This comes partly from the, oppos uh, uh, the uh, from the opposition there. There is between us and the ties of religion and those of the world, a thing unknown to the ancients. So the idea of religion, you have religion. Here he's saying that religion changes. The ancients didn't have this religion that imposes a, a, a breach, he said. This is the hint here. Um, again, we are told that uh, uh, we are told by the last uh, 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 that by the last upsets all the ideas of the first two. So the world upsets it. The yeah, world, everything in the world. And that is that this becomes partly for the opposition there. Uh, opposition there is between us and the ties of religion and those of the world. Okay. So that religion and the world, this, these two things are at odds in a sense. Whereas the ancients, that didn't, uh, this was a thing was unknown to the ancients. Okay. So that looks uh, at, at chapter five and on education, Republican government. It was it uh, it is in Republican government that the full power of education is needed. Fear and despotic government arises in both from threats and chastisements. Honor and monarchy is favored by the passions and favors them in turn. But political virtue is a renunciation of oneself, which is always a very painful thing. One can define this virtue as the love of the laws and of the homeland, the fatherland. Right? This love requires a continual preference of the public interests over one's own, produces all uh, produces all the individual virtues. Uh, they are own uh, 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 they are only that preference. So that public interests over one's own and produce all, uh, all the. Uh, uh, Produce all the individual virtues. They are only that uh, pr uh, preference. This love is singularly connected uh, with democracies. In them alone, government is entrusted to each citizen. Now, government is, uh, is like all things in the world. In order to preserve it, one must love it. One never hears it said to the king. Uh, 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 sorry, one never hears it said that kings do not love monarchy or that despots hate despotism. Therefore, in a republic, everything depends on establishing this love, and education should attend to inspiring it. But there is a sure way for children to have it, if it is, uh, uh, it is for their fathers themselves to have it. It is for their fathers themselves to have it. One is, ordin one is ordinary in charge of, of giving one... Um, charge of giving one's knowledge to one's children and even more in charge of giving them one's own passions. If this does not happen, it is because what is done um, in the father's house is destroyed by the impression from the outside. It is not young people who degenerate. They are ruined only when grown men have already been corrupted. So therefore, there was this, this idea passions of this and that only that children do not degenerate, young people do not degenerate. It's when the grown men have degenerated, right? been corrupted in that sense, right? So let's look at six. Some Greek institutions. The ancient Greeks persuaded oh, that peoples who lived in popular governments must necessarily be brought up to be virtuous, uh, 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 made single institutions to inspire virtue. When you see the life of Lycurgus, this is in Plutarch, right? The, uh, the laws he gave to the last Madonians, the Spartans, you, be, uh, uh, you believe you are reading the history of the uh, 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 of the Sembervais. The uh, laws of the Crete were original, uh, uh, were the original for the laws of the last Madonians, and Plato's laws were uh, uh, their corrections. So Plato's laws is their correction of this, right? I pray that I pray that one pays a little attention to the breadth of the genius of those legislatures who saw that by running counter to all the uh, re running counter to all revised usages usage and by confusing all virtues they would show their wisdom to the universe like Kyrgyz mixing larceny with the spirit of justice the harshest slavery with the extreme liberty the most heinous he heinous feelings with the greatest moderation gave uh, stability to this town it's like the uh, spark. Notice this. This, this, this mixing larceny with justice. Mi uh, you know, it's teaching the children to steal and rob, and like the, the kids. You know. um, uh, um, the ex uh, 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 harsher slavery that treat with the extreme liberty of the city. No, Spartans. The most high, heinous feelings, the way they treat the, uh, the the helots and things. 
with the most greatest moderation, gave stability to this. He seemed to remove all its resources, art, commerce, civil, silver, walls. One had ambition there without the expectations of bettering oneself. One had natural feelings, but, uh, 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 but was never child, husband, or father. Modesty itself was removed from chastity. In these ways, Spartans was led to greatness and glory with such an infallibility in its institutions that nothing was gained by winning battles against it until its police was taken away, right? Crete and Laconia were governed by these laws. Lacedonia was the last to yield to the Macedonians, and Crete was the last prey of the Romans. The Samanites had the same institutions, and they provided the occasion for 24 triumphs for the Romans. We can see that which was extraordinary. Uh, we can see that which was extraordinary in the Greek institutions, in the dregs and the corruptions of uh, in the dregs and corruptions of modern time. Right, showing the, the dregs and the corruptions of modern times, we see the extraordinary. The legislature and uh, Honet Honet. Uh, 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 again, this is that uh, person of honor that was the, the talked about, right? This is interesting. Look at me, D again, D. See note D B above, right? The, this is that the gentleman of honor courtly does not he's not a noble by birth, right? Uh, has formed a people in whom integrity seems as natural as bravery was among the Spartans, right? Uh, uh, Mr. Penn, a true Lycurgus. So Mr. Penn is the 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 the, 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 uh, um, the Pens uh, Pennsylvania uh, uh, Pennsylvania who formed Pennsylvania against slavery, the Quaker, right? Uh, Mr. Penn, a true like I guess, and though he has, uh, uh, though he has had peace for his objection as like Kyrgyz had war, they are alike in both the unique path on which they had set their peoples, in their ascendancy over free men, in the prejudice they have vanquished, and in the passions that they have subsumed. Paraguay can fur 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 furnish us with another example. Some have wanted to use it to level uh, uh, charges against the society, this is the Jesuits, right? Which consider the pleasures of commanding, the, uh, uh, the, uh, 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 in other words, which consider the pleasures of commanding the only good in life, but governing men by making men happier will always be a fine thing. It is fortunate for the society that it was the first to show that, that in these countries, the idea of religion joined with that of humanity by repair, uh, repair, uh, repairing the pillages of the Spaniards. Uh, it has begun to heal one of the greatest wounds mankind has ever uh, has yet received. The society's exquisite feeling uh, for all it calls honor and its zeal for a religion that humbles those who listen far more than those who preach have made it undertake great things. And it, and it had been it, and it had been successful. It had brought di dispersed people out of the woods. It has assured their sustenance, it has closed them, and in doing so, it had done no more than increase industry among men. It would have, uh, it would have accomplished much. Those who want to make similar institutions will establish, will establish a community of the goods. Of, of goods of the Platonic Republic, uh, the respect he required from the gods, the separation from strangers in order to preserve the morals, and commerce done by the city, and not by the citizens. They will produce our arts without our, uh, our luxury, and our needs without our desires. They will prescribe silver, whose effect is to flatten the, fair, the fortune of men beyond the limits nature has set for it. To teach men to preserve vainly what has been assembled and uh, amassed vainly, to uh, multiply desires infinitely, and to supplement um, and, and to supplement nature, uh, uh, which has given us very limited means to excite our passions and to corrupt one another. This is the danger of silver, right? Uh, the ep epidemics. This is note nine, and uh, um, uh, this is the, the uh, Plutarch's Moralia, the questions of degrees, right? 
Uh, the epidemians felt that their communication with the barbarians corrupted their morals. Elected a magistrate to do all their trading in the name of uh, 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 trading in the name of the city for the city. In this way, commerce does not corrupt the constitution, and the constitution does not deprive society of the advantages of commerce. So the solution of this idea of the, the, the city was, oh, we don't want people doing commerce. Commerce is not good. That's the H. This is the Greeks. The Greeks had a hatred of commerce. Uh, the idea that commerce is really something low and vulgar and destructive. And that, therefore, the solution of this was to have someone else do it, you know, a mediator doing it, right? Um, and this is, one could say that's the Jews, right? The Jews and uh, the Greeks and the slaves. The slaves did it for the Romans in that sense, right? Uh, now, chapter 7. Uh, in what uh, in what these cases, in, in what cases these single institutions can be good, the those, those, those Greek institutions, right? These sorts of institutions can be suitable suitable in republics because political virtue is their principle. But less care is needed to induce uh, induce honor in monarchies or to impose fear in despotic states. In other words, in other words, republics need these kind of institutions and in the concern of monarchy, in commerce, and things like this, in order to you know to promote political virtue. This is less the case in monarchies and despotic. Furthermore, they uh, can have a place only in a small state where one can educate the general public and uh, raise a whole people like a family. So therefore, these kind of virtuous republics can only be small in that sense. The laws of Minos, Lycurgus, and Plato assumes that all citizens pay a singular attention to each other. This cannot be promised in the confusion, oversights, and extensive business of a numerous people. Okay, so therefore this republic, this Greek city, this Greek political life has to be small. It has to be a small scale scale. It can't be done at this larger scale. That's why Gemeinschaft, Gesellschaft problem, right? This is the Gemeinschaft, Gesellschaft. At the level of, of, of Gemeinschaft, you can have this control, this uh, 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 intimacy, this kind of regulatory aspect. But at the level of Gesellschaft or society, these larger things, you don't. There's only You only have this limited connection. It had been said silver must be banished from these institutions. But in large societies, the number and variety, the presses and the importance of businesses, the ease of purchase and the slowness of exchange, all of these require common measures. In order to, in order to carry one's power everywhere or defend it everywhere, one must have that to which men everywhere have attached power. Okay? So therefore this idea, this, this is why society, this is, in other words, you, you, it's this, in other words, the virtue and the political virtue is not possible in a large scale situation. Okay. And, and, and it must be everywhere. Chapter 8 Explanation of the paradox of the ancients in relation to the Moors. Polybius, judiciously, Polybius, judiciously, Polybius, tells us that music was necessary to soften the Moors of the Arcadia, who lived in a country where the weather was, so, weather was gloomy and the cold. And that the inhabitants of Clithenes, who neglected music, surpassed all the other Greeks in cruelty, and that never had so much crime been seen in, in a town. Plato is not afraid to say that no change can be made in music which is not a change in the constitution of the state. Now, Aristotle, who seems to have written his politics in order in order to oppose his feelings. To, to his feelings to Aristotle, Plato's, nevertheless agrees with him about the power of music over Moors. Again, this is like, the you know, the discussion of music in the Republic and also discussion of music in Book 7 and 8, particularly Book 8. Theoprasus, Plutarch, and Sabo, all the agents have thought likewise. This is not an opinion proffered without reflection. It is one of the principles of their politics. In other words, this is interesting. Thirteen, uh, uh, Plato's laws says perfection of music and gymnastics are the most important uh, elements of the city. Damon will tell you. He said, "What sounds are capable of giving rise to the basis of souls as insolence and contrary to virtue." This is uh, uh, thirteen of that. He says. It is. Thus, uh, that they gave laws. It is thus that they wanted the cities to be uh, wanted the cities to be governed. 
I believe I can explain this. One must keep in mind that the Greek towns, especially in whose, uh, um, those whom principal aim was war, all work and all professions could lead, uh, that could lead to mining, earning silver, were regarded as unworthy of a free man. Most arts, Xenophon said, corrupt the body uh, of uh, 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 corrupt the body of the one who practices them. They oblige one to sit in the shade or near the fire. One has no time for one's friends, no time for the republic. Um, it was only when uh, some democracies became corrupted that craftsmen managed to become citizens. Aristotle teaches us that this teaches us this, and he holds that a good republic. Will never give up, uh, give them the citizen. Again, that's, again, this is, uh, um, this is a uh, uh, book two, chapter seven, formally est established in Athens that the artisans should be s slaves of the public. Right. This is, which Dan criticizes. This. So I, 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 there's a little game going on here, right? Architecture, our culture too, was a servile profession. And it was ordinarily um, it uh, it was ordinarily some conquered people who followed uh, uh, followed it. The Helots farmed for the uh, Lacedaemonians, the Percheri for the Cretans, and the Pedasti for the Theseans, and other sl uh, slave people in other republics. Finally, all common commerce was disgraceful to the Greeks. A citizen would have had to provide service provide services for a slave, a tenant. Or a farmer, the idea ran counter to the spirit of liberty, of, of Greek liberty. Thus, Plato wants any citizen who engages in commerce to be punished. In the Greek republics, one was therefore in very awkward position. One did not want the citizens to work in commerce, agriculture, or the arts. Nor did one want them to be idle. They found an occupation, the exercise derived from gymnastics and those related to war. The institution gave them no others. One must regard the Greeks as a society of athletes and fighters. Now their exercises, so appropriate for making people harsh and savage, needed to be tempered by others that might soften the moors. Music enters the spirit through the organs of the body, quite uh, uh, was quite suitable. It was a means between the physical excesses that renders men harsh and the speculative sciences that render them savage. One cannot say that music inspires virtue. It would be inconceivable, but music curbed the effects of the ferocity of the institution and gave the soul a part in education that it would not have had, uh, would not had otherwise have had, that it would not otherwise have had. I assume, again, this is the whole point, that music was there for the Greeks. Music plays a important role because the Greeks focused against commerce. Now, his argument here is commerce. Commerce replaces music. That's the kind of hint here. And for the Greeks, the Greeks, just no commerce, none of that going on. They wanted to punish people who, uh, uh, for, for, commerce was unsuitable for a free man. And the only thing suitable for a free man are the, uh, is you know war and you know competition activity, and therefore this was hard would lead to harsh and that you needed something to counter the harshness. The music counters it, right? So in other words, but music curbed the effects of the ferocity of the institutions and gave the soul a part of a, a, a part in education that it would not have that would not otherwise have had. I assume that among ourselves a society. A people so enamored of hunting that they did uh, they did nothing else. They would surely acquire a certain roughness. If these same peoples were also to develop taste in music, one would soon find a difference in their manners and their morals. In short, the exercises practiced by the Greeks aroused in them only one type of passion, roughness, anger, and cruelty. Music ar arouses all of them and can make the soul feel soft pity tenderness and sweet and sweet pleasures those who write on morality for us and so strongly prescribe the theater make us feel uh, 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 the theaters make us feel sufficiently the power of music on our souls if the drum uh, if uh, if 
One gave only drums and trumpets fanfares to a society I have mentioned. One would not fall short. One, uh, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Would one not fall short of one's goal than if one had gave, gave it a tender music? In other words, if one gave it to that society. In other words, if the ancients were right, therefore, when under certain circumstances, they preferred one mode of music to counter uh, an, uh, uh, to uh, uh, another for the sake of the Moors. In other words, they, it was they picked the music they did was to counter the effects of their Moors uh, uh, for the sake of the Moors to moderate the, 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 the things. Um, so in other words, uh, the ancients uh, the ancients were right, therefore, when they, uh, they, under certain circumstances, preferred one mode of music to another for the sake of Moors. But one will say, why should music to be preferred? Of all the pleasures of the senses, none corrupt uh, 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 the soul less. Of all the pleasures of the senses, none corrupt the soul less. We, uh, we blush to read in Plutarch that the Thebians, in order to soften the mores of their young people, established a law, a love that ought to be prescribed by all nations of the world. In other words. And again, this is uh, Plutarch 23. This is going to be. Um, and Plutarch's uh, 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 Pilodatus, right, uh, 18 to 19. I think this is like, naughty, naughty. In other words, that we blush to read in Plutarch that the Thebians, in order to soften the mores of their young people, established a, their laws, a love that ought to be prescribed by all nations. Okay, this is again, this is the thing, uh, this is where we end, um, how we end the chapter about this, discussing the ancient. The last two, you know, he ends the discussion of education discussing the ancients. Encountering the ancients, saying that the reason for the ancients doing it was because one of their uh, of their, their warlike character, their their emphasis of of, of they were a um, their political world was a smaller world. It was a world of warring cities. Um, they wanted to have harshness. They wanted war, and their focus was on a different type of situation. That they despised commerce. Um, they lived in the world before larger scale societies emerge could survive or operate uh, and, and and they would live in a world where there was agreement between you know the religion did not religion did not divide the, the world in the way that religion in, in the post uh, in the, well after Judaism Christianity and Islam does will do so therefore we stop if you have any comments or questions please put them below uh, um, I, I, if you have any uh, uh, issues or is topics you wish I could go further here, please put comment in there. If you like it, like it. If you didn't like it, didn't like it. But if you liked it, share it with a friend. Encourage it. Share it on social media. Get other people to do it. If you have not subscribed, please subscribe. Um, if you want to follow me on social media, the links are below. Um, again, these are I'm coming out twice a week. I'm sorry for not doing as much of this, but I'm still kind of recovering and it's kind of slow this semester. Um, I hope to do some more small ones. We'll see what happens. If you want to uh, help me do these things and, you know, uh, help out and help the channel grow and help me do these things, you can become a uh, uh, through subscribe star, Patreon, or other means. Or you can buy one of my books uh, available uh, through Amazon or any of the distributors. Um, Again, thank you very much, and I will see you tomorrow when, or, or not tomorrow, next time we post, when we will look at uh, the next chapter, chapter five, book five, sorry, book five. Take care and have a nice day.